So in this video, we're gonna go over how the hand gesture recognition system works. Now the concepts and things that I went over in the initial video do still apply where I have two Hall Effect sensors in here and I can use the Hall Effect sensors to get really fast, snappy action, which is really awesome. But I don't want this to be momentary action like it is now. I shouldn't have to keep holding my finger here. It should just be that I do the gesture, they eject, I do the gesture again, they retract. But I can do a fist like I mentioned, I can move my fingers around, metal won't set the sensor off even magnets that are the same polarity that trip both at once aren't going to do it. It's just this very specific action. And then my finger doesn't move, like I mentioned. It's not easy for it to move left or right. So it's very accurate, really easy to use. Um, so in this video, we will go over the full circuit of how this works. And we will go over the wiring that I have laid out here because I will need to make a chipset still to get these running so that it's not just this freeform circuit here. And then I need to work on the actual logic controller that's going to sit on my arm that will measure, did this data line just go high? And what state is the mechanism currently in to determine if it should do an ejection action or if it should do an unlock and retract action. Now, before we get too far into it, I do wanna make a quick plug for PCBWay. They're who made this PCB for me. As with all of my PCBs, I get them through PCBWay. They really just do such a great job with my PCBs. My chips just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. These little guys use SMD components to get the size down this far. And you can see how tiny these little XOR chips are. And again, their PCBs are flawless. Their ability to get fine precision is really good. So I definitely recommend going through them if you have some circuits that you wanna see made into reality. Now, when it comes to actually soldering these chips up, some folks are wondering how I actually do that. Well, to do this, you're gonna need some thermal paste. You're going to want a solid backstop, something that can take some heat. I'm just using a cooking pan here. Um, and then you can use what's called like a reflow oven. It basically is going to bake your entire board. But so far I've been able to get by just fine using a heat gun. So I apply heat carefully until I see that the solder begins to congeal and solidify. And then I pull it off and it works great. So another thing to keep in mind with some sensitive lens type components like LEDs, they're designed to still take high heat, but sometimes the heat gun can be a little intense. And so you do want to actually point it a little bit away from at least the lens. So you're not discoloring that part. But yeah, I mean, heat gun, cooking sheet, pair of tweezers, you're good to go for a lot of these small components. So the next thing I want to discuss is actually what I've got going on with this circuit on the tabletop. We've basically got our solenoid here. As I mentioned, there's going to be a flyback diode to allow it to um, fly back on that voltage spike. We're gonna have this go to that plus 12 volt main power supply. And then essentially the thing that's the gatekeeper here from allowing the current to flow through this is this big power MOSFET, which has a little one mega ohm resistor attached to ensure that this will switch off very quickly once the sensor voltage goes back to zero. So this is all that I've got going on there. It looks more complicated because I've got some more wires from different voltage sources and the actual sensor chip wired up, but effectively this is what happens. Sensor turns this on, this dumps current, sensor turns off, this goes off, flyback discharges rapidly, and that's it. So I've got a voltage source here just to power the actual hand gesture recognition chip because it relies on about five volts to operate on. So I've got these AA batteries here, which I've got grounded to my common ground so that the MOSFET is able to still be triggered by that same voltage source. This is also a high power MOSFET, so it's able to switch this solenoid without heating up. And I've got a one mega ohm resistor on here to ensure that the output pin doesn't stay high. And then since I'm driving a solenoid, I of course have my flyback diode. This is really important for designing a solenoid based system because it's essentially a large inductor. So once I cut the ground off on this solenoid, it's actually going to collapse the magnetic field. The voltage is then gonna climb and approach infinity or until it's able to actually arc and complete the circuit. So you use a flyback diode to allow the current to fly back and not harm any of your other components. So I did spec this out based on my voltages and amperage acquired by the solenoid. So we're gonna look at the Hall effect sensors. These are pretty simple sensors really. You've got one pin, which is your output. You're gonna have it connected to ground. They will need a positive voltage because it's a real IC. They, they need positive voltages and grounds. And then if a specific magnetic field goes through the component in the right direction, it will for all intents and purposes, connect the output pin to ground. So what I can do is just do a simple pull-up resistor here and make it whatever value, we could just do 100K. You could do 10K, you could get with, with 1 million, doesn't really matter. It's a low current system, doesn't really have any current demands, but that's a pretty common value and safe enough. So if we look at this simple circuit, when there's a magnetic field present, it's going to actually return a zero because it's zero volts because this is connected to ground. Now, if I remove the magnetic field, this is now floating. And so the voltage is gonna pull this up. So we're gonna be at five volts now on this floating line. So we can read that as a one. So it's a digital output pin. 
So let's go ahead and create two because I do want two Hall Effect sensors because I want them to essentially ensure that the output will be low if they're both active. So let's say you're climbing over a wall or something and there happens to be a magnetic presence there that trips both of them. You don't want the blaze to eject. Again, I'm trying to make these as reliable as possible and then connect this to ground here. So now we've got two active low outputs, right? When they're active, they're zero. When they're inactive, they're one. So if we were to draw this out, if both gates are inactive, they're both returning ones. So we want our output to be zero. Now, if either one is active, like zero and a one or a one and a zero, we want both of those to be active states. And then if both are active, again, like I mentioned, I don't want it to be active because something's gone wrong there if they're both active. So I want it to be a zero. So if we look at this, we can see this is perfect for an exclusive or. Exclusive OR conditions must be true. And we don't have to do any flipping of our logic here for, for a positive output, for active high output logic, because there are only two variables that flip-flop. So it doesn't really matter which one's actually true or not. If I was wanting to incorporate these into my design, then I'd have to begin using NOT gates and stuff to convert these signals, but we don't have to. So let's go ahead and draw our XOR chip. So this is gonna take inputs A and input B and it's going to do the XOR operation and return output Y. And then we have to connect this to the voltage on the chip and then also ground this because it's a real IC. But this will basically ensure that Y is high if either one is active, but not both. And so this chip can output a maximum of 20 milliamps. I certainly encourage you to look up specs of your parts online. The documentation for electronics is almost always really good and it's actually quite understandable. So since this is 20 milliamps, I don't wanna run like a big LED off of this. I'm gonna put a 1K resistor. So we're running this only at like a couple milliamps and that's plenty for most LEDs to actually be quite visible. And I don't want this to be like a shining bright light on this anyways, it's just an indicator. So 1K is perfect, draws just a couple milliamps. And then we can have, and then we can have this come out as our output pad, which we see right here in the middle of our actual PCB. So now we can see the three pads here. We've got our positive voltage, we've got the ground pad, which we could just pull off here as a pad, and we've got our sensor pad, which is right in the middle. And this is active high logic. It will return five volts if either one is active and zero volts otherwise with the indicator operating in that way. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode here. If you wanna see more content from me, definitely do subscribe or let me know in the comments how I did or if there's any other questions on the content that I covered today. Um, but as always, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next time.